So a lot of the companies that we're talking about got their start as chemical companies making, in many cases, chemicals for warfare. Uh, so if you think about uh, the way that uh, DuPont or Monsanto or Bayer or BASF or Syngenta, a lot of these companies started out making chemicals that were used to make explosives, for example, or to make chemicals that were used as defoliants. Explosives, if we're talking about World War II, defoliants, if we're talking about Vietnam, they were very good at making chemicals that were good at blowing things up or, or uh, killing plants. So once these wars were over, these companies had these huge stockpiles of chemicals and a decline in their market because now we weren't, the, uh, the army wasn't buying them anymore. So they had to figure out ways to sell these things. So they started coming up with great uh, uh, strategies to sell these chemicals to both to farmers and to homeowners. So uh, for example, uh, herbicides, the things that are made to kill plants, in this case they're called weeds, but let's just call them plants. These chemicals kill plants. You can sell them to soldiers who need to, you know, burn down forests in Vietnam, or you can sell them to farmers to kill weeds, or you can sell them to homeowners to kill weeds. So it's very interesting to look back at the marketing strategy. So they, they, they convinced farmers that rather than doing the age-old practice of, you know, pulling weeds, which we've, um, you know, humans have been doing for thousands and thousands of years, or tilling them up. Now you could just spray everything. That will kill everything. That was considered to be a labor-saving device, which it was. Uh, it was seemed to be a great advancement in technology. The problem is, of course, is all those chemicals immediately kill the, the, uh, the uh, biological integrity of the soil, and as soon as it rains, all those chemicals go into the rivers and go into our drinking water, and of course, have a very deleterious effect on aquatic life, fish and aquatic plants and everything else. It also enters the food chain because once we eat the fish, we get those chemicals in our body. That's, that's one thing. To homeowners, they said, uh, you know, we've got all these chemicals that'll magically kill everything except your grass. Now, as we talked about earlier, uh, you know, the United States suburbanized like crazy. And in addition to houses, Americans became obsessed with their lawns. Like they had their house and they had their lawn. And suddenly the lawn became this like outdoor carpet. And it became this weird status symbol. Like you had to have this perfect lawn that was perfectly mowed and perfectly groomed and perfectly weeded or else your neighbors might think you were somehow like, you know, a threat or something. In fact, if you go back and look at the early Levittown uh, newspapers from like the 1960s, I'm not even exaggerating about this. You can find newspaper articles from Levittown that said like, uh, that neighbor of yours who has an unruly lawn might be a communist. Like they were equating like a crazy lawn with a crazy person or something. So like there became this peer pressure for all these new suburban homeowners that your lawn was you. Like you had to present your lawn as the, uh, the outer representation of your personality, your family or whatever it is. In other words, if you didn't mow and spray, you were somehow like a suspicious character. Which is a great strategy for these companies because they can of course then turn around and sell you these products that will make your lawn look exactly like your neighbor. So, what they were able to do was, for example, come up with a product that could kill all the clover in your grass. Now, I don't know about you, but clover happens to be a really soft, happy little plant that if you run around, your kids run around on bare feet, no problem. The problem is that clover, when it flowers, also attracts bees. So what these companies did, because bees love clover flowers, these companies said, are your kids getting stung by bees? If so, we can solve that problem. We can sell you a product that'll kill the clover, which will get rid of the bees, and now your kids won't get stung by bees. People are like, oh, that sounds great. I don't like bees. I don't like my kids getting stung by bees. So they buy this product, spray it on their, their grass. It kills all the clover. Trouble is, now we have no more bees. So bee colony collapse is directly a result, not only of these poisons that we're putting on our lawns, but also the, d the destruction of their food source. That's one problem. The other problem is that clover happens to be what's known as a nitrogen fixer. Like clover grows in your lawn, it pulls nitrogen out of the atmosphere, puts it in the soil, that helps everybody grow. Grass doesn't do that, clover does. So you kill all the clover, now you've got nitrogen deficient soil. So what these companies do is they turn around and say, are you having problems with nitrogen deficiency? Well, we can sell you this fertilizer. That's what fertilizer is. Fertilizer is a way to put nitrogen into your soil. 
So when you know you see these companies telling you that you need to spray herbicides and fertilize your lawn, you actually don't need to do either. You can just let clover grow. It'll mean you don't have to spray herbicides and it'll keep your soil healthy. So instead of buying zero products, now you have to buy two. And once it rains, all that stuff washes into the river and now we've got that problem. So that's the backstory. So these companies started as chemical weapons companies, then they started as agrochemical companies and lawn care chemical companies. So they have all these chemicals, they're spraying them all over the place, and then they decide or they discover that you can create seeds that even if you spray them with these chemicals, the plants will still grow. So the way that these GMOs evolved was that the scientists figured out at the company's behest that they can create a plant that will grow into a crop and you can spray the crop with these chemicals. It'll kill everything except for the GMO seed that you or the plant that you've created. So one of the big criticisms of GMOs is that what they really are is a delivery system for these chemicals. Because if you can convince all American farmers to plant this kind of seed, then they will naturally buy all the chemicals. So GMOs can be marketed as this or that, but certainly the way they are used is a way to convince farmers not only to plant these seeds, but to then spray all their crops with these, these herbicides and, and, and insecticides. So that's one of the big suspicious things is that, that this is really just a vehicle to keep their market for chemicals running high. Well, and think about this. You used to go on a road trip and you could drive for four or five hours and your windshield would be covered with bugs. That doesn't happen anymore. There are no more bugs. And that actually is a really bad development because bugs are the baseline of the food chain for birds. So what you're finding is massive bird population crashes because there's no more food. Like this idea that we can somehow chemically sanitize the world, like we don't like mosquitoes or something, so we create these bug killers that kill mosquitoes, but then they kill everything else too. And you know, you don't want to live in a clean room, you know? You want to live in an, an active, alive biosphere, and we have just like completely obliterated some things with this. There are two large categories of GMO crops in the United States. One is called BT corn, which is a kind of a, it's a corn that has a bacteria gene inserted into it that serves as uh, an insect repellent. That's one thing. So you can put a gene in a corn plant that will make the plant unattractive to corn borer insects. Then there's another category, which is to kill, or, or as we've said before, GMOs that will su survive even when you spray them with things that kill plants, weeds. So one resists inse insects, one uh, stands up even though you spray it with herbicide. So the theory is that if you can create corn plants with a a gene inserted into them that makes them unattractive to insects, you will then not have to spray insecticides on them. That turns out to be true. Like B, what's called BT corn requires lower use of insecticides because the, in, a, in a essence the corn itself is an insecticide because it has the gene of an insect repellent bacteria in it. Now people who grow organic food still don't like that. They say even if it's true that BT corn uses less insecticides, you're still eating a genetically altered crop that has been engineered to make it repellent and even deadly to insects. So then when you eat the corn, you're getting that insect repellent in your diet. So organic farmers, even though it, re it reduces the amount of insecticides, they still don't like it. And I should say, organic farmers, uh, B I should say BT itself is a naturally occurring bacteria in the soil. And organic farmers can spray, this is sort of sounds strange because it sounds like I'm confusing things, but you can, an organic farmer is legally allowed to spray a naturally occurring bacterium called Bt on top of their crops. And they've long done that to, to create um, insect resistance. What GMOs have done is taken that same bacteria and stuck it inside the genes of the plant. So you're not spraying it on the plant, you're inserting it in the plant. And I have spoken to organic farmers that say, spraying a naturally occurring insecticide on top of the corn is something I can live with, and is in fact legal under organic rules. Inserting it into the plant is something I would never do, and it is not legal under organic standards. 
The idea being that the Bt bacteria that keeps the insects away will wash off and is natural and non-toxic to the human diet. Therefore, it's okay and legal under organic standards. Inserting it into the plant means that when you eat it, you're going to ingest it. That's the argument on Bt. The other side, the herbicide, that is to say the, the plant-killing chemicals that are used to create, for example, Roundup Ready soybeans, um, those are sprayed on the plants to kill the weeds and uh, uh, allow farmers to grow these crops without having to, to, to weed them. So if you take those two things, the weed killers and the insect resistors, and total them all up, it turns out we're actually using more. We're using, I think the, it's about 7% more total chemicals. Even though the BT is reducing it, the weed killers is so high that it actually outstrips. So the argument that we're using fewer chemicals is actually not true because the weed killers outstrip the insect killers. Mm -hmm.